Well, twelfth time is the charm, so now we're going to talk about regression, finally. Sort of the last time. No, not for the last time, because there's more content, but at least I think it's actually working this time. So let's talk about regression. There's a nice funny joke on this panel, which I'm really too tired from all the multiple times I did this to uh, try and explain. It's a good joke, though. I, I recommend looking at this joke. It's high-quality joke content. Um, yeah, so let's dive in. Let's dive in and talk about the content here. So what is regression analysis? It's a process of trying to understand what's going on when you have two numerical variables collected from the same group of people. So paired data, two variables. Regression analysis is the most common approach to trying to understand that data, to understand relationships between, or the relationship between those, those two variables. So what we generally tend to do is we, we build and evaluate models of the relationship between the variables. And that's, when you calculate a correlation coefficient, that is itself a very simplified model. It'll make a slightly more complicated model, but not much. The correlation coefficient is almost the regression line, and the regression line is, is the model that we're talking about here. Um, so we make very simple models. We make linear regression models. They are, very, they are a straight line relationship, and if something doesn't really fit a straight line relationship, we shouldn't be doing this, but this is a good way to learn how to do all the other kinds of regression stuff as well. And straight line works for a lot of stuff. So a lot of the stuff that we can do when we're doing this is we find the best straight line model. We use it to describe the relationship like saying, you know, R equals you know, 0.47 or something. Or we talk about the line itself and we say for every one year of child education, then we predict that 2.3 new legislative measures will be passed. I don't know, I'm making crap up. Um, and once we've got the model and we, can, and we know what it's doing, how it works, then we try and see how good it is, how well it fits the data. We're gonna look at residuals and things like that, which we've talked about previously. And then we're gonna, most of the time, Okay, I'm doing something different and now my pen looks awesome. Most of the time we're going to test the, signific the statistical significance of parts of the model. Specifically, more like just one part. We're going to test the significance of the correlation coefficient, which is the same as the slope of the line. Well, for the purposes of significance testing, their correlation coefficient is just a standardized slope. So we create this model and remember when you have in algebra, you have the Cartesian coordinate system, and you have like some line going through there, you know you just really need two points to describe it, or you can do a point and a slope. So the slope is like the angle of the line. So if you have one point and the angle, that's all you need. And that's kind of what mathematics usually uses most often to, to define a line. You just need two numbers. You need a, any point and then the angle of the line. And each of those can be represented by one number. So the angle of the line is the slope, and the one point that we usually use is the y-intercept because this is the y-axis here and this is the x-axis here. So the line has to cross, a straight line at some point crosses the y-axis unless it's perfectly horizontal or vertical and those are dumb, but I'll mention them later briefly. But if we know the y-intercept and we know the slope, like rise over run, change in this over change in this and you divide those and turn them into one number, yeah, then you've got your line. Well, we're just going to take that and we're going to apply it to a situation where it's not some abstract hypothetical mathematical thing, but it's actually the line that we got by trying to fit a nice line through our data. We're going to look at that line and then just use algebra to describe that line. Um, and then once we've got that line in there, we're going to say, how good is it? How, and we're going to look at like the residuals, how far all of these things are from the line, for instance. And that is, has a lot of overlap with looking at R and R squared. So R and R squared, they talk about the fit of the line as well. So then we do inference, and that's one of the last things that we do. One of the last things we do is inference, and that, you know, inferential statistics is all about populations. So you've got your line here. And I've already told you that the slope, yeah, that's a terrible Cartesian coordinate system. Oh, Rene Descartes would be embarrassed. So you've got your 
line here, and it's supposed to be straight, and that's your slope. And your slope, more or less, is equal to r. So when you test them for significance, it's the same. So you have the null hypothesis, the slope, or r, is zero in the population. So this is our this red stuff here is our sample, and this dashed line is the population. So like the null hypothesis says that. And so we're testing to see whether we are enough different from a flat line, mathematically flat. Ooh. Ambulance coming down my street, right outside the university. Who knows? It's warm. Maybe somebody decided to go out and get drunk. Uh, how cynical I am. I, I could have come up with better explanations. So our inference is going to be about the slope. Now the slope, we're going to call it B1 in this class. You could test B0, which is the, the y-intercept. Nobody cares. Like, very rarely do we have any interest in testing y0. It's not something we tend to do. So there's going to be an equation. Because you remember in, when you took algebra in high school, you had y equals probably ax plus b. I think that's the most common thing. We're just going to change the name of a and b, and then we're going to put a hat over the y. But basically, it's the same thing. So we're, we're just going to use this algebra. We're going to hack algebra to tell us about data analysis. That's wh how we do this. And so this part, predict the y is going to be a special definition of y. It's going to be the predicted... Oops, I didn't want that to come up yet. I'll show you in a second. It's going to be the predicted value of y if x is equal to 0. And that's just the y-intercept. That's what the value of y when x is equal to 0. And this is the same for all... Uh, all data points that you have but then this you need to have like this like real x i but the slope is the same for all data points so this is your x value in your data set and then predicted y for this x in other words there's lots and lots of these and we have to take this x and this predicted y so the line you know you got your dots I'm gonna go through this like a lot of times so pay attention think about it you come up with your best fitting line if you've got this value here, right here, right? This is the x value. This is x sub i. And then whatever that comes over to over here, that's y sub i. Notice y sub i isn't in here anywhere. Predicted y. It's the, the point on the line. That's y hat sub i. So that's the, that's the predicted y that goes with this x. Anyway, you probably didn't get that because I made the, my graph really small. There's a bigger graph later, I promise. Anyway, this is what we're doing. We create a line. It's an abstract line through our dots. And then this model doesn't talk about our dots at all. There's, there's no dots in here. There's just the line. And it says if you pick any number on the x-axis, then all you have to do is multiply that times the slope and add the uh, y-intercept, and you'll get a number on the line. You'll get a y-value that places you on the line. You have your x, and so if you want a y that is on that line, you just use this formula here. You need those two numbers. You need the slope and the y-intercept. We usually write this reverse. I always thought we should do it this way. The stuff that you add up equals this, but we always we always do it reversed. Uh, I think I messed up this. We have um, the predicted y for this x value equals, and then we put like the real x for this particular person times the slope which is the same for everybody, plus the y-intercept, which is the same for everybody. So that's the predicted y if x is 0. That's the y-intercept. The slope is the slope. Anyway, we just kind of rearrange it. Uh, but it's the same thing. In math, you can do that. You can just rearrange stuff sometimes. So let's take this data set, which you, I think, have seen before, and see if we can talk through this a bit and see how this works. I think I might want a different ink color. I think I might want a beautiful like a baby blue color. Okay. <coughs> and maybe thinner. So let's talk about this. You've got this data set. Let's talk about how this works. Now I'm not going to show you how to make the line yet. I'm just going to show you how the line works. Making the line, I'm not sure we're going to actually talk about how to do it. It's really easy. Um, you just need like means and standard deviations, essentially. You need means and standard deviations from, there's multiple different formulas because mathematically you can make lots of different recipes to bake your bread. But you just need means and standard deviations for this thing, and that, um, 
and then you can come up with the line. So I'm not going to show you how to do that quite yet, but I am going to... Oh, I guess I can't move my dumb face out of the way on your screen. Oh well, it's just poor choices. So, back here. Here's the line. Don't worry about how we got it. It was magic. We got it. Uh, and here's some, da some data. Let's say that that x variable down here, this is a cognitive test that people got like maybe in, in high school. And then over here is something that I made up and it's fake called the ESAT. I had to make it not the real SAT because the values actually are fake and they, and they go outside <laughs> where the regular SAT should go. The regular SAT should really only go from 200 to 800 and I kind of messed that up. But anyway, let's call this the ESAT. Let's say you've, you've got a cognitive test that some psychologist gave a bunch of students in high school and it has scores that can go up to, I don't know, maybe 20 at the upper end. And you want to see how well those are predicting people's uh, fake SAT scores in college. And all my biases are going to come out. They're probably correlated. I don't know if they're correlated like this, but we'll see. Assume that this is not as stupid as it might actually be. So look we, what we've got here in our data set. We've got a value for the test itself and for the SAT and the predicted SAT. You don't have a predicted X. So this is X and this is Y and this is Y hat. Y hat means predicted. It means it's not a real value. It's not in our data. It's what our model predicts. So the orange line here is our model. It's the model of the relationship between the cognitive test and the SAT score for individual people. Well, for these people, anyway, in this data set. So erasing this junk on the screen, let's look at some of these values. This person right here, this is who we're looking at right here. They have a cognitive test score of three, right? So you can see on the x-axis, their cognitive test score is three. Now, that is paired up with um, an ESAT score of 445. I'm kind of guessing. It looks like it's kind of in there. Anyway, let's assume it's ultra super precise. So that line over there, this person has two pieces of data. This person has their, their cognitive test score and their ESAT score. So cognitive test is there. ESAT is up here, and I need to erase this because I just made a mess again. Man, how do I keep making messes? So then there's another person. Uh, oops, I need to go back a bit. These animations are janky. There, I need that. So X score, Y score, predicted Y. So the predicted Y is this right here. That's the predicted ESAT score. And that's the value that the model says Y should be. So this star here has coordinates of 3 and 293. And that's what the model says anybody who gets a 3 should get. Now correlation, the correlation of X and Y is the same as the correlation of Y and X. In other words, the order of Y and X doesn't matter for correlation. But for regression, it totally matters. You have to decide which of your variables is y and which of your variables is x. y is the one that you're constantly trying to predict. And so in this case, you're predicting there, and there's your predicted value for anybody who gets a 3. Now, you could have multiple people who all got 3s, and they could all have different actual uh, scores on the ESAT, but the model can only predict one score for them. This one, do, 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 just right over there. Just that score right there. So here's a person who got a four, and that's, this is the person we're looking at right here. A four on the cognitive test. And the ESAT, they got a 327. But the model says they should have gotten slightly, or sorry, the ESAT, they got a 273. But the model says they should have gotten something slightly higher, a 327. So you notice the stars are all going to be on the line because they have to be. Anything the model predicts is just the model values. So these are predictions from the model. Now, prediction doesn't mean future prediction. It just means there's this set of data and it's like, let me guess what's in that other room. I'm predicting what will be in that other room. So it doesn't mean I'm looking into the future. I'm looking into the present or the past. You can use it for future prediction sometimes, depending on how you collected your data. So this person gets a six. Now their actual score for the ESAT up here is almost 400, it's a 391. Oh wait, I got that wrong. This should be like, okay, I did this kind of wrong. That should be like 425 or something. 
Oh no, <laughs> that's what that is right there. Okay, just pretend that none of what I just had just said happened because it's lame to have incompetence in your professorness. Uh, so their their actual score was um, 425, but their predicted score was lower than that. Their predicted score is only down here at, at let's say 390. So you've got your actual score for the, the y outcome, the y variable, the outcome, the one we're trying to predict, and then you've got the predicted score. So this one, in this case, it was lower. And that's just what happens when you draw a line through a bunch of dots. Some of them will be higher, some of them will be lower. So the line over predicts some and under predicts others. So the last individual example here, this person gets a 6.5. We're looking at this person in the table right here. Their actual ESAT score, I said it was maybe a 646. And their predicted ESAT score is down here at right around 400. I put 399 for kicks. So all these predicted ESAT scores, they go on the regression line. The regression line is the model. And the regression line is very similar to just putting the correlation coefficient on a line. It's almost exactly that simple. It's just missing an intercept. Um, so you've got all these individual x values, and each of those x values has y values. This is just the remaining ones that are up there. But then you also have these predicted y values. So you have individual values for the x variable, for the y variable, and then predicted by the model. In other words, what would you have gotten if we, if we said your x variable has to be whatever's on the line for you, on the, whatever matches up with the regression line? So the regression line is what tells us it, it's the model. So that's what tells us the model, what, what the model predicts for you. So let's get rid of some of this junk here. I think one of these things. All right. So now you remember we had residuals, right? So you have, you know, this distance here is this residual, and this distance here is this residual. Residu resi <laughs> residual. Oh, I don't want to switch. I really don't. I don't want to switch animations here. And I don't want my computer to freeze up. Okay. So you've got residual values. So you've got. You've got like this residual value here and what? What? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> never mind. Let's just pretend that you saw the residuals there. They were there. It's just the difference between the predicted y and the actual y, but we've been through that before and I'm sure we'll go through it again at some point. So the equation that we use, wait, what in the world was that? This is madness, I tell you, madness getting some lag and some craziness. Okay, so we're back here. All right, so let's look at residuals since I'm here. There's a residual. I'm just trusting that at some point these residuals will. There's a residual. There's a residual. So these, all the differences between the observed and the, at, and, and the predicted, so the predicted and the observed Y, those are the residuals the differences. The residual is what we still can't explain, what even having this extra variable, this this um, cognitive score or whatever, that's a C, um, even having that we still can't explain this much. We still don't know why not everybody got a value that's right on that regression line. So the residuals are still there. I didn't need to make a big point about them, just that hey, there they are. So the, the equation becomes, as we've seen before, the predicted y for this x, we can write that this way. We can say y, oh wait, I have this thing here, <clears throat> y hat for this x. But if you want to be extra careful, you can say y hat sub i. And that lets you know there's a bunch of y hats and that we're just talking about one person or one individual or whatever it is in your data set. Now, there's an individual predicted y value. There's an individual predicted x value. There's also an individual real y value, but that's nowhere in here because the model doesn't have the real y's in it. It just has the predicted y's. This is just the line. Nothing off the line is in this equation. This equation is just the line that you saw in that picture. So the slope, there's no sub i, so the slope is the same for everybody, and the y-intercept is the same for everybody because the angle of the line is the same no matter where you are on the line, and there's just one y-intercept. I mean, it's just that one point, the end. So this is a way of kind of breaking this down and seeing what it looks like. Um, what's most common in social sciences is this. They reverse the B. I know you learned AX plus B, 
But in the social sciences, um, people have learned for like a hundred years, BX plus A. I don't know why. Someone wanted to be special, Sir Ronald Fisher, like, misinterpreted his telegram message from across the pond, whatever. But this is what we do, BX plus A. But this is becoming less common, and it's what's becoming more common, and what our textbook uses is a more mathematical and computer science friendly representation, where we just have a different name for the slope. We call it B1, because it's a coefficient. The numbers that, can, that we can plug in and that we have to find from our model um, that we care about, B1 and B0. So there's going to be a whole bunch of little X's. There's going to be, we don't usually care. We're like, yeah, that we cared when we collected the data. We don't care about you now. It's like we're the worst data parents ever. Get out, earn a living. Um, but this we still care about. What do we multiply every single x by? In other words, the slope. We care about that slope. And remember, the slope is more or less the correlation, correlation coefficient. And we sort of care about this. Sometimes you can even do models that don't have an intercept in them. We just ignore that fact. It has an intercept and we don't care. It's like that, you know, that weird kid that you didn't even want. And you're like, what are you doing in my house? Okay, these, these examples are really dark. I'm moving on. I don't like to think of any kid having that experience. All right, so um, we have some models. Oh, and I forgot, I screwed this up. So a mean is a model of all of our data values. And we have a symbol for the population mean and a symbol for the sample mean. And we could say that a model of data variability is uh, the standard deviation, but actually you could also say this is a measure. I mean, it's semantics, I guess, and how you want to look at it. It's the measure of the fit of this model. It's, the, it's how well the mean fits the data. So it's the residuals. So variance is variance, standard deviation, those are residuals. So We've got our model of the XY relationship. Think of it as like a two dimensional mean instead of a one dimensional mean. A mean is just one point. It's one number. So it's one dimensional. A two dimensional mean is a regression line. And so the regression line, if we happen to know all the population values, we would maybe use capital B's. I mean, who cares? Sometimes people use capital B's anyway, just uh, just to confuse everybody but it's not that confusing because we never know the population values we know the sample values and so this is where we can say y hat equals b0 plus b1 x1 okay but frequently people will write we'll just rearrange the, the two terms on the other side they'll have, say y hat equals b1 x plus b0 and they will put the intercept second oh and I could put the i's there if you want to I just forget to do them because who cares I know that there's multiple ones. I know if you get into real stats, then there's so many different formulas. It's really important to get this notation correct. But this formula, we use it a million times, and so we know that the i is there. We don't even bother putting them there most of the time. So let's just do a quick review of lines with algebra. You remember algebra? Yeah. Remember lines? OK. Everybody remembers lines because lines are just so much fun. So here's your Cartesian coordinate system. And there's a line. Oh my gosh, how can we describe that line? Well, algebra has the key. There's actually a lot of different ways. You might know that this is the point-slope formula, uh, the point-slope method of, of creating a formula. There's other ways of describing a line. Just met naming two points is a common one. I think there are some other weird ones. But we use the point and slope. So that's one point. Y intercept equals three. That's a Cartesian system. That means X equals zero. This is X equals zero because X is zero, one, zero, and it, we haven't gone to the negatives yet. So x equals zero and y equals three. So that's the point we, we reached. y equals three and x equals zero. That's the y-intercept. That's one point. And then the slope, like we could take any two points. Like we could take these two points right here. All right, I'm going to erase this. This is a mess. We could take these two points right here, this one, and this one. And the distance between them, I don't know why that drew a fancy straight line for me. I don't understand this thing very well. Um, the distance between them you can talk about as being the change in x and the change in y. Remember remember this, rise over run? You take the change, any two points, you take the change in y for those two points uh, that the line had between those points. 
and divide that by the change in x. So the change in y is put is three, the change in x in x is three. So three divided by three equals one. So the slope is one. So and our y intercept is three, so our model would be this y hat equals three plus one x or one x plus three, whichever way you want to write it. Or want to write that. Now keep in mind the following. This is just our theoretical model that we formed from data. So in statistics, we don't just have the line. We got the line by calculating some stuff from some dots that are all over the place. Maybe they're like this. So maybe this line fits the data that well. Or maybe the line fits the data really terribly. Uh, I was going to make it, yeah, scattered all over the place. Maybe the the data are, are much more scattered around and the line isn't as good a fit. The correlation coefficient actually gives us good an idea of that, which the regression line does not. So they, they have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, here's another line. There's our y-intercept, three again. It's where x equals zero, y equals three up here. That's our y-intercept, that's our one point. And then see if you can figure out the slope. Let's take these points. And it was kind of arbitrary in which points I chose. Why did it do that? I don't understand why sometimes it does the nice line. I wish I knew how. I'd, I'd make it happen. So the change in y is 2 because it goes from 3 to 5 over that period. These two period points in the line take it on just on the y-axis from 3 to 5. But the change in x is kind of big. It's 10 because it goes from 0 all the way up to 10. It goes that far. And so the slope is going to be 2 divided by 10, 0 0.2, 1 over 5, 1 fifth. So y hat equals 3 plus 0 0.2x. You could also say 0 0.2x plus 3. And again, maybe this has data that's just everywhere, like big, scattered, spread out data. This came from some data. That's where we got this, this straight line from. We did a little bit of number, number crunching on the means and standard deviations. It's actually quite easy if you want to look into the formula. If you want to have fun, it takes like five minutes or less. And uh, that's where our line came from. So the line is just the mean. It's like a created, constructed, abstract representation. The real data is not the line. The line is just something we use to help us understand the data. So here's another line. There's our y-intercept, six. Yay. And then see if you can think of how much the line rises. Six. And now we always go left to right, right? So this is not rise, this is a drop. So y actually went from six down to zero. So y had a change in y is negative six, but x is always positive. The way you, when you do this going left to right, and there's no reason why we have to do this except so that mathematicians can always be speaking the same language and not have to be confused about what they're doing. By saying we always go left to right, then x is always an increase, but y can be positive or negative. So if y is negative, then the whole slope is negative. If y is positive, then the whole slope is positive. In other words, if there's any line that goes up, that's a positive slope. And go down, that's a negative slope. It's also a positive correlation or a negative correlation. That's how those things work, because the slope is the correlation, kind of. The correlation is the standardized slope. They each have slightly different amounts of information in them, but they have a lot of overlap. So for that change in y of going down 6, we went up 3 and x. So negative 6 divided by positive 3 is negative 2. So our the, the, line that the equation that describes this line is y hat equals 6 minus 2x. Now, you don't know why we care. Why do we make a line formula out of this? It's so that in certain situations, we can say, oh, for every one unit increase in x, then we have a 1.5 decrease in y, whatever, or two unit decrease in y. And then we plug in the names of our variables. And in psychology, we don't do that that often, but it's still important to know how this stuff works. Um, because the second reason why we need to learn this is because we will do other statistics that you won't understand at all unless you have a pretty good grasp of this stuff. So here's another one with a little shallower slope, but still negative. The y-intercept is 6. And let's just take two points where they cross the axes. Um, so between you know, this point here it's going to do a weird straight line for me again. Why? Why? I don't understand why you do that. It's beautiful, but I wish I could control it. It's like having superpowers, but they just come and go. And then you're in front of the bad guy, and you're like, ha-ha, I will use my straight line power. And then, 
bam, nothing happens, and he punches your face in. So that's a lot of superhero movies, isn't it? When you know the origin stories. Okay, so change in Y again is negative six, but this time as Y went down negative six, X went up a lot. It went up 12. So the slope is 0 0.5 now. It's a much shallower slope. So Y hat equals six minus 0, 0 0.5, or it could be Y hat equals zero, negative 0 0.5 X plus six. Now notice how the negative stays with this, with this and the plus stays with this. So if you're gonna rearrange this, the negative goes over there and the plus goes over here. This is just kind of basic algebra stuff, but honestly, this is, I have to think twice about this and it was never easy for me in school. I didn't do well in math for many, many years. I'm not sure I ever did really well. And there is a professor not knowing how to make pointers point where they're supposed to point. The y-intercept is five, which is not, it's, okay, it's, it's there with my not so straight lines. What if I do this? Can I do this? And then just do that? No, it didn't do it this time. See, the superpower didn't work. So the change in y is zero. Every point along the line is a y of five. Y, it never goes up, it never goes down. So a perfectly parallel line is dumb, but it can happen. It means a, cor a perfect correlation of zero. If, you're, if you've got dots that are just, <laughs> you remember the plus and minus thing we did to get how the correlation co coefficient is calculated. If you've got the same number of pluses as, as minuses in those different quadrants, um, the positive and the negative and the negative and the positive, etc., then you'll end up with a correlation of exactly zero. I, it's weird for that to happen in real life because how would you make sure it was perfectly zero? But I suppose it could happen with real data if you had discrete integer data or something. So if the correlation is zero, then you have uh, change in y is zero over infinity. So zero over infinity, it is actually kind of a thing Infin if you know the math of working with infinities, which I do not. But it's not horrible. You're not trying to divide by zero. You're just trying to divide by infinity. Okay, it's dumb. But it could happen if you had a perfectly zero correlation. In which case, you'd be like, oh no, the math has broken down. But before that, you'd be like, oh, look at my data. It sucks. There is no correlation. My hypothesis is not supported. I'm going to go home and cry now. Maybe have a big drink of something. So you wouldn't even get to the part where you're worried about the mathematical niceties. You'd just be like, your software would say r equals zero and you're like shoot I was gonna say something worse but this is being recorded so here's your like you could I think zero would work or undefined I, I don't know enough math to know which one but anyway you wouldn't even bother doing a, an equation but this could happen if r was equal to perfectly zero if you had a vertical line yeah in geometry and mathematics you can have that in data analysis I'm I think this happens if you measure something that is a constant. Like, what if you want to find out the relationship between, I don't know, like a quiz score in elementary school and child age, but you only chose like 50 kids and they're all 10 years old. So <laughs> you're like, these are all my kids. I think maybe it could happen like this. Those are all my kids. It's dumb. If that happened in real life, you wouldn't bother analyzing any data. That's not a variable. That's a constant. This isn't a relationship between two variables. Y is infinite. X is zero. You can't divide by zero. Your equation sucks, and you have to put something in it that isn't even a number. So I put an alien head, which seemed good enough. Anyway, it's dumb. Um, this won't happen in real life unless you screwed something up really badly. So a little bit less abstract. Let's just walk through a little bit more of this. Exam scores and class grades. So this is a graph I pulled out of, it might have been JASP, it was probably R, I use R a little more often, it's similar to JASP except a lot more complicated to do things. So you've got, uh, I, I put a line there at the actual zero, some graph people are just so clever trying to not put the zeros where they belong, they're like, it looks so nice, I'm like, screw you man, I want to see the, the data. Anyway, you have to put the zero where the actual zero is to find out where the y-intercept is. Here, the, the intercept is 58. It's an exam score of 58%. And so this person right here, they have a letter grade, which is uh, a D. So this F, D, C, B, and A. So this person right here, um, they have that much of a residual, that much difference between their predicted and their actual value. Okay, that's not supposed to be a degree Y. I thought I changed all these. That's a delta Y. So change in y, oh no, that's not the, 
I hope I fix this later. Change in y is 10. That's not their residual. Change in x is 1. So the slope of this line is 10 over 1, which is 10. Now, this is super abstract. I mean, who cares? Because this scale is weird. It goes from 0 to 100. This scale goes from 0 to 4. So it doesn't make any difference unless you're going to interpret it um, in the in the following way. You, you, you write out your your uh, regression equation and you plug in the names of the variables. You put predicted instead of putting a hat over the entire exam grade, although some people do that. So the predicted value of the exam grade is equal to 10, which is your slope, times whatever their letter grade is down here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus just the number 58, which is kind of abstract. It's just That's just what happened. That was our y intercept there. And um, <laughs> the data that this came from is this business. And I only had letter grades. I didn't have half letter grades or anything like that. There's the equation there. And you can see there are these people who got ones. And that's the residual for one of them. That's the residual for the other one. Lots and lots of people got twos. There's lots of different residuals there. Because you could only get 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. There were only five possibilities. But you can still do regression with that. It still works. This is still numerical, even though it's discrete. Five possibilities isn't zero, and there's a pretty good spread. So anyway, um, the interpretation we'd make of this is something like, so your slope is 10. So for every one unit increase in x, so every one letter grade increase on average, we would predict 10% higher scores. In other words, the model says that anytime you go one unit to the right, you have to go 10 units up. That's what the plus 10 means. And so since these things actually make sense, exam percent at letter grade, you can say for every one letter grade increase on average, we predict that a student would on average predicted, you know, we, we know this isn't the real data, we would, we would predict or the model predicts that the student would have an increase of 10% on their score, on their exam score. Uh, and that's where, the, where we use the data, where we got it from. So we need to interpret coefficients. Now the coefficients are B1 and B0. Those are the coefficients. Those are the numbers that will be different from equation to equation. So this is a lot of what we do. B1, this is what we care about. We don't care about in interpreting the y-intercept. We care about the slope. B1 is the slope. So it's the slope of the regression line. It's rise over run. And now this is a division sign that I put here. I could have used the, this thing. It has a name. I can't remember what it is. But anyway, it's this divided by this, right? So it's this per this. And when you divide this by this, then it means for every one of these. So if you take your fraction of like, you know, 15 over 3, and you reduce that to like 5, or sorry, is that right? 15 over 3? Yeah, 5. I can do math. I'm terrible at math. It means 5 over 1, right? So it means 5 for every 1. 5 on the top for every one on the bottom. Um, so that's what this stuff means. And we translate that very logically into a way of interpreting our co our um, this coefficient, the slope of the line. We say for each one unit, now you need to in figure out what the units are for your x, because it's the units of x. Then b1 is the number of units, whatever those are change, which could be increase or decrease, in y. So you need to figure out what the y units are. So if b1 is positive, then you'd be like, for every one unit increase or in, or going up, or every one more of these, some something that's talking about going up. And if b1 is negative, you use language to talk about going down for every decrease, every reduction, less, etc. So in this case, we have um, GPAs down here. So this is like GPA and then over here is some sort of like test score because it's fake data, I made it up. Um, we could figure out the rise over run business here. It's like for every one unit 
increase. Now it has to be the units of GPA. You have to go one whole number, whatever that is. So this is one whole number. You have to go up one whole number or there was a one here. So for every one whole number increase, I think I did my graphics a little stupid, but for every plus one in X, the slope, this, the slope is what happens to Y. So for every plus one in X, you have, and I think I did my graphics wrong so the numbers don't work out, but this is the interpretation. For every plus one in X, the slope is what happens in Y. So for every one GPA point increase, on average, we predict that a student will have 13.93 uh, points lower score on the test. Now this is on average because the dots are not on the line. You always have to say predicted and on average because all we're doing is talking about the line this interpretation of B is just telling us about the line, what the line predicts, but this isn't reality. So you have to say things like on average. So on average, if we do this, then we go down to here, etc. So it's all averages and typically, etc. So what, for every one unit, one point of increase in GPA, we, pre, we, pre, we predict a decrease of 13.93 exam points, almost 14 exam points. Yeah. Um, so for instance, B1 is 0.47, means there's 0.47 Y, there's a plus 0.47 Ys for each X, which means each plus one X, whatever the units are, is plus 0.47 Y units. B1 is 15.9, means 15.9 Ys for each X. So each plus one X, and you have to pay attention to what the units of X are, then we predict on average minus 15.9 y's. In other words, 15.9 fewer y things or less in y, whatever the thingy magic is. Negative 312.5 means that a negative, that for every one x there are a minus 312.5 y's. So for each x whatever, one x increase plus one x, then we predict minus 312y, so three, 312 fewer y's, or less of y, or whatever it is. We have to keep the units in mind. So we usually don't care about the y-intercept in interpreting it. You can interpret it, it just means that if x was zero, this is what we think y would be. It's not that complicated. It's not as, quite as complicated as the slope. The slope you have to think about a little. The x, not as much, but we don't care. Uh, some, especially in the social sciences, when you use kind of arbitrary scales where the zero doesn't really mean zero. So a, a true zero scale is called a ratio scale, and we very frequently don't use ratio scales. We, in, I should say, infrequently use ratio scales. So student GPA versus the mean number of hours studying every day. I use these because they actually have meaningful zero points. Student GPA, I mean, this could go further down here to like a zero GPA, right? But I started the scale a little higher, just so I could fit it all on the screen, I think. Um, so keep that in mind that I played games with the scale here and it's a, a bad thing to do unless you're doing it in predictable ways that the viewer understands it's how to lie with charts which people do all the time so the mean number of hours studying per day I have all these weird big fat chunky dots they look delicious to me licorice dots um, so the mean number of hours studying per day we get our little perfect not perfect our best revenge it's not perfect in any way I can't believe I said that our best fitting regression line to go through that and here's our line. Here's our equation. 0.244x, getting my camera out of the way, plus 1.8. So for every hour increase in studying, on average, we predict your GPA will go up by 0.244. Now that's like for the average student. Now think about what that means. Does that work as well down here for this average student? If this average, if you go up, you know, one from one to two, do you get this average? Does, is it really an average of the dots here and here? If you go up from here to here, is that really an average of these dots? So you have to pay attention to the pattern of the scatter plot. If you have a scatter plot that's a positive correlation but gets like a lot of variability as you go along, 
and very little down here, then it doesn't make sense to have one line to describe it because for every whatever increase there we get, but there's a ton of extra variability as you go. The variability gets worse and worse. And that's actually one of the things we pay attention to. We try and not do that as much as, as possible. Now the y-intercept is kind of dumb. It says a person who studies zero, we predict a GPA of 1.8. That might not make any sense. Once you get down to people studying zero, zero hours at all, then you're talking about a different kind of a dynamic probably, which this model can't deal with. This model doesn't have any, any way to talk about that. All right, I think my graphics are accurate here. So uh, again, I thought this was all changed. So change of, in X is plus one. So for every one unit increase in X, so one GPA point increase, we predict on average 0.244 increase in your GPA. Or so, sorry, for every one hour extra of studying that you do for day, I'm just, it's late. Uh, we predict 0.244 points in your GPA that will be increased on average. So on average, did these people go up this much here? Did these people to here, did they go up that much? Uh, we assume that they are. We assume that that's what's happening. And it, since it's a straight line, it's the same all the way along. The slope is exactly the same no matter where you are. So the interpretation is for every one, whatever the units are, increase in whatever x is, the model predicts a B, or I should say B1, I forgot to change this because I used to just call this B for years and years. A B1 unit, whatever slope number is, increase in or decrease in y. So you've got this equation here. You've got y hat equals, you know, I, I always do it like b1x plus b0. I always do it in this order. Some people do b0 plus b1x. It's common both ways, I guess. So this number, this number, you plug it in there. And this number, you ignore because we don't care. And then you need to know the names of these things and the units of these things, of these variables. You need to know the names and the units of x and y so that you can talk about this stuff. So let's see what happens. Predicting a grade point average from the number of hours you spend studying per week. Now let's say that your equation gives you b equals 0 0.3. So think for a minute, pause your video, see if you can come up with the answer here. Which variable is x and which is y? Predicting this from this. So this, the prediction is going this way. This is doing the predicting. So this has to be x and this has to be y, right? So if you walk through what we have on the previous page, for every, so is it plus one X or plus one Y, the first thing? It's plus one X, right? So it's gonna be one of these things. Additional hour studying, additional hour studying, additional hour studying, it's not gonna be that one. Um, oh no, additional point of GPA, it's not gonna be that, because that's, that's putting the Y in the, in the X place. So it's gonna be this because Plus one X is that, plus one X is that, right? And then how much of an increase? This says GPA increases by 0.03 and this says GPA increases by one. Okay. By 0.03. That's where this comes in. We're interpreting this. So for every one point or one one hour additional studying, on average, we predict a person's GPA will increase by 0.03. Wildly different numbers from my previous fake made up data. This is also probably fake and made up. All right. So not as much walking you through, not as much hand holding. Number of hours of TB per day predicts number of aggressive acts per day. B equals 0.87. Oh, once again, I keep forgetting. This is B1 slope. B1 equals 0.87. 0 0.87. So which of these variables is x, which is y? Is b1 positive or negative? And that should help you figure it out. 5, 4, 
three. Pause if you don't know it yet. Figure it out. Two, one. Ta da! So TV is the x variable because it's doing the predicting. TV hours of TV per day predicts prediction is going this way from this variable to this variable. So it's x to y. Um, TV is predicting number of aggressive acts per day, and so plus one x. This number is how many y's for every plus one x. So how many aggressive acts per day for every plus one hours of TV? So every one hour in increase in TV, 0.87 more aggressive acts, which is weird to have a 0.87 of an act. But, you know, we do that kind of thing when we're talking about summary statistics like means and standard deviations and stuff like that. Number of calories that a person consumes per day is predicted by years with a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. I might have actually looked this one up. I can't guarantee that, though. Maybe, maybe not. It feels like it's the middle of the night, but where I am, it's 6.40 p.m. Winter, man. What are you going to do? All right. I'm going to count down. Five, four, to the answer. Three, two, one. See if you got the answer right. So, explanation. Calories that a person consumes per day is predicted by so prediction is going from this variable to the other one anorexia so years with a diagnosis of anorexia is predicting number of calories so this is x and this is y and so plus b is always how many y's for every one x so one x is a is one of these x's one year with a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa and a number of calories per day is going to be this and it's negative so fewer so every one year that you have <clears throat> and this is kind of terrifying actually anorexia is the most deadly psychological disorder it kills more people than any other one it's terrifying for every additional year with anorexia nervosa we predict on average your mileage may vary not everybody has average results but on average we would predict or the model that we constructed from data predicts 287 fewer calories per day so when do we interpret b when the units are easily understood and when prediction is important. It's less important or desirable when units are abstract or arbitrary. And in psychology, there's a lot of this. So, like IQ scales. The mean is 100, standard deviation is 15. What does that mean? What is one IQ point? So we're going to use, in our interpretation, there'd be things like, if IQ was one of our variables, we'd say for every one point increase in IQ, we predict, okay, what is a one point increase? I don't know. We put it in there. We use the arbitrary thing if we need to. Um, we sometimes don't actually care about the prediction stuff. We just care about the correlation coefficient. And that's actually quite common. We just care about the correlation coefficient. Now, the correlation coefficient is, well, let's talk about this example here. So interpreting B0, let's say X is your car price, Y is your miles per gallon, and B0 is 93. So if a new car's price was zero, we would predict a 93 miles per gallon. That makes no freaking sense. If you got a car for free, we would expect that it had amazing highway mileage. No, that's dumb. It's stupid. <laughs> when you get down to X equals zero, sometimes with real world variables it doesn't make any sense because the variables the zero points aren't really super locked into the world and reality and meaning things break down often and when that happens then just don't even think about b0 you have to put it in for the math otherwise other stuff doesn't work but you know interpret it you just put it in your answers so if x is the act score and y is the college gpa and b0 is negative 0.35 then we would say for every plus one ACT, oh no, sorry, we're talking about Y and stuff. But for a person with an ACT score of zero, we would predict a GPA of negative point. Neither of these make sense. You can't get an ACT score of zero and you can't have a negative college GPA. What kind of sense does it make to even talk about that? It doesn't add any knowledge to the world to mention that. It's fun to say this stupid thing, but it is a stupid thing that makes no sense. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that a little bit here. So. In the, the support data set, which you haven't played with very much, but sometimes our classes do, it's a support study, a study I did about college students' perceptions of support. Um, this lecture is nearing an hour. Let's say an X, we could take an X value, an X variable, 
of high school GPA and Y of college GPA. How nice, they're the same scale. That's neat. And the correlation between them turns out to be 0.389. Now, honestly, I don't know why I did that. It's 0.39. Sometimes I even just say 0.4. There's no reason to... Uh... Oh, what did I do? I rounded wrong. 0.39. Um, so our equation could be this. Predictive college GPA. Predicted college GPA is 1.81, and that's the y-intercept there, plus 0 0.39 times your high school GPA. So you could interpret this, etc. cetera. Uh, I've got some, a little graph here, I believe, where this interpretation is gonna happen. Clicking didn't happen, so there we go. So here's the data represented as a graph. These are people's high school GPA across the bottom here, college GPA, the y-axis. Um, the scales are kind of squished. We stretch this out sometimes wider than tall, even though it's not strictly visually accurate, but it's a very common thing to do to spread out the x-axis a bit more than the y. And our numbers are so arbitrary most of the time that we don't really care. So let's look at our slope here for a one-point increase there from 2 to 3 on the x-axis. So a one-point college GPA increase. My computer just slowed way down here. Then we predict how much of an increase in y? Looks like about 0.5-ish, a little bit less. 0 0.4, 0 0.3. Oh, I can't believe I did my rounding wrong. When did I do this? What was wrong with me? I didn't even drink back then, so how did this happen? So, you know, that should be 0.9. I rounded improperly. I truncated. That is never okay. All right. But shouldn't the intercept be 1.81 why is it here at like 2.5 or something because asshole software said I'll just show you the data and not show you the zero points and it's being helpful but the zero this is not zero this is like 2.2 .2 or something like that so if you want to see how the data really look or should look with the y-intercept in the place it belongs I can do it I can Oh, poor computer has slowed down so badly. There we go. That's what act is actually going on. If we extend each of these scales to where there's an actual zero point on the slide, on the graph, there's true zero down there. Well, true, I don't know. Anyway, the zero that applies to GPAs. I don't know if it's like a true physical zero. Oh, I put the dot in the wrong spot. The dot goes where the zeros actually cross because even this graph doesn't put things right at zero. Graph makers and software, they're like, this is not so much more attractive. Okay, so there's the line. We'd have to extend it way down there to figure out where our y-intercept is. And our y-intercept is going to be 1.81, finally, on that, if you extend the line actually to where zero really is on the x-axis. So, at this point, with the slowness of my computer, I'm not sure this is even working. So I'm going to wrap this up and end this lecture, because otherwise we end up just talking about, like, a lot of stuff that we don't need. Wait, did it speed up again for some reason? Fine, I'll keep going. So another tricky example, just to keep in mind that everything becomes about the actual units of the thing you measured, not about what makes sense, but about what's actually there which could be crazy, right? It depends on how people measure things. So uh, this is from some data that I have from my dissertation. Let's say X is right-wing authoritarianism scale on a questionnaire for that. The mean of, of that questionnaire is negative 14.5, more or less, the standard deviation is 25. Y is the religious fundamentalism scale, and that's on a slightly different scale. The mean is negative 3.9, standard deviation is negative. No, it's not. It's equals, not negative. You can't have a negative standard deviation. Standard deviation is 29-ish, 20, 30. And the correlation is about 0.7. It's pretty close. So here, this correlation is about 0.7. It's 0.69. Don't say nice. Don't say nice. And so the predicted right uh, religious fundamentalism score for any given individual 
not their actual one, but the predicted one, can be found by negative 12.25, which is the y-intercept, plus 0.59 times right-wing authoritarianism. This is not the same as 0 0.69. 0 0.69, 0 0.59, um, because this is the standardized version. The correlation coefficient is the standardized slope. It's not just the exact slope. It's like when you reduce, when you take all the units out. Now, the right-wing authoritarianism scale is constructed this way. It has all these questions, and you answer them, and this is how they get scored. I mean, you might not see the scoring in front, but if you say neutral, you get a zero. If you say moderately agree, you get a two. If you say strongly disagree, you get a negative three, right? And then you average these things together or add them up, I think. Anyway, you can get positive and negative scores there, and zero is the middle. So your stats program, you pump that in there, it's going to tell you intercept is this value. And it'll have the name of your x variable here. And that means b1 is that. So b0 is this guy, and b1 is this. And it gives you a bunch of extra information about each of them. And this pr, sub or whatever, is a p-value for a hypothesis test. And negative 2e negative is like negative is less than 2 times 10 to the negative 16th power. In other words, it's the smallest number the computer can represent. So it's basically almost zero. So anyway, p is really small. p is less than 0 0.001 or something like that. So it's a small p-value. Don't worry about that right now. That's for hypothesis testing later. Uh, just worry about this. And so you can make your equation. Predicted religious fundamentalism is equal to negative 2.25 plus 0.59 times right-wing authoritarianism score. So this is a graph of this stuff, and I've got it broken down into two groups, which you can ignore. It looks kind of Christmassy, though. Here is zero for x. The way you score this thing, you just add things up, and so you can end up with a whole bunch of negative values, a whole bunch of positive values. And so you, when you think of the um, y-intercept, you start to think, oh, it's that thing over on the left. No, it's wherever zero is. And if zero is in some crazy spot, like in the middle of here, then that's where your y-intercept is. That's your y-intercept. Negative 12 point whatever, like that. So the y-intercept is uh, an interesting example of how to pay attention to what's actually in front of you instead of what you think should be there and it trips you up believe me now let's talk about the correlation coefficient um let's say that this is you know the mean of this value of this variable here and then the, this is like the mean of this variable here i don't know wildly guessing and then we turn all these things into z scores and so it's like plus one plus two plus three minus one, minus two, minus three. Why does it do the straight lines? Plus one, just like we did. Whatever it is. And so everything here has Z scores attached to it. Now this is how you calculate the correlation coefficient, right? Well, in that case, once you did that, then you have different units. Then you have plus one is plus one standard deviation. And then whatever happens here is also a standard measured in standard deviation units because z scores are always standard deviations it's how many standard deviations you are away from the mean so when you turn all of the data into its z scores on x and y then the slope is going to be r the correlation coefficient that's what i mean when i say this, this Correlation coefficient is a standardized slope. If you standardize, turn into z-scores, both of your variables, if you turn them into z-scores and turn all your data into z-scores instead of the original units, you just change the units there. Now your units are standard deviations because a z-score is number of standard deviations away from the mean. And so when you're measuring that and you have a slope that's expressed in number of standard deviations from the mean like that, then the slope is r. And the y-intercept is zero. Always be. Oh, actually, I should have realized that that's. <laughs> I wasn't thinking. That's the y mean because it always goes through where zero and. Well, maybe not. I need to think about this. I think I screwed that up. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop this recording for right now. We're going to. This is not a perfect recording, but holy cow. I've tried this so many times. I'm just hoping it actually worked for once. Enjoy more.